Hello, welcome. Let's look at this wire question for physics 2018. The number one question. The SI unit of sound energy is A hertz hz B candela CD C decibel DB D joules J so what is the SI unit for sound energy now for us to understand this very well we need to take note of very important uh, aspect of solving this problem now the SI unit for energy in general is joules now since the SI unit for energy in general is joules then sound energy is a form of energy so the SI unit for sound energy is joules and that makes D the answer now for more clarity we are going to look at the SI unit for the other uh, quantities that have these other ones so let's look at heads first heads Z is the unit for frequency CD also known as candela is the unit for luminous luminous intensity in case if you see the question in another form that's what CD is for now DB also called decibel is the unit for relative loudness of sounds that's what it is for so some people might be uh, might want to pick decibels but it's not actually decibel because decibel is the unit for relative loudness of sound but if you talk about sound energy if you talk about sound energy the unit is joules so you can see this hertz is for frequency Candela CD is for luminous intensity. Decibel dB is for relative loudness of sound. So take note. So the right answer is Joe's which is the unit for energy because energy is involved and the type of energy we are looking at is sound energy thank you now let's look at question number two for physics Yek pass question for 2018. The general definition of elastic modulus is A. Stress over strain B. Strain over stress C. Stress times strain D. Square root of stress over strain so what is the answer to this problem for us to understand this problem we need to understand the simple statement of Hooke's law so we're gonna look at Hooke's law which states that stress is proportional to strain provided 
elastic limit is not exceeded that's the statement of the hooks law that stress if you want to put it math mathematically you say stress is what proportional stress is proportional to strain and once you have such mathematical representation you can introduce a constant so introducing the constant of proportionality very very important if you want to change your proportional sign into equal to sign you must introduce the constant of proportionality and this constant for this case is known as Young's modulus of elasticity that's the name of the constant that we are going to be using in this case so if we introduce it you can now say that stress is equal to constant which is young modulus of elasticity times strain that's what you have so making y the subject you can now have that y young modulus is equal to cross multiply so you have stress over strain and that is the elastic modulus so the right answer is a which is what stress over strain and that is the statement of uh, your uh, hooks law so in essence y which is elastic modulus is equal to stress over strain very very important so you can be using this to solve some problems and we also know that stress is simply equal to force over area and we know that strain is equal to the extension all over the original length so with this problem with this equation you can solve a whole lot of problem using the elastic modulus stress and strain so this expression is the same thing as saying force over area all over the increase in length which i will call here extension all over the original length so that is the statement of uh, Hooke's law explained more where the elastic modulus is equal to stress over strain because both of them are proportional. So that is the answer. Thank you. Yes, let's look at this question number three for y egg physics 2018 the diagram illustrates a simple barometer which distance measures the atmosphere pressure a p q b q r c r s d q s so which of these distances measure the atmospheric pressure is it this pq is it qr is it r s or is it q s so which of them for us to understand this much better i'm gonna make this a uh, very diagram again and it's basically something like this with inverted tube then we're gonna have the mercury this is the mercury and it's inside this tube up to a limit so you have the atmospheric pressure acting downward pushing this mercury so when it pushes this mercury it's going to move 
into this so here is vacuum whereas this very height here is the height that is taken and this height is actually equal to for normal at sea level 760 millimeter mercury millimeter mercury because you measure millimeters of this mercury that is inside so the height from here to here is actually the height of the atmosphere which is this atmospheric pressure so when you look at this you see that here is p here is q here is r and here is s so the actual height is q r q r that makes b the answer to this problem because b is where we have q r so q r is b that is the answer to this problem q r so that is the answer thank you Now let's look at question number four for physics YEC 2018. The property of a body to remain at rest or to continue in a uniform motion in a straight line is called A. Momentum B. Inertia C impulse d energy so what is that property of a body that makes it to want to remain in a state of rest if it is resting or to continue in a uniform motion in a straight line when it's moving what is that property we all know that this property is inertia because that's the definition of inertia but i will also explain the other options so let's take the definition of initia first initia is that very property of a body that makes it to do what to remain at rest or to continue in a uniform motion in a what straight line rectilinear motion in a straight line so that is what inertia is now let's look at other things like energy why did we say the answer is not energy energy is simply the what ability or capacity to do work ability of a body or its capacity to do work and it's actually force taken through a distance now what is impulse impulse is the force the impact of a force at a particular time or for a number of time that's force times time that's what impulse is and momentum what is the meaning of momentum Momentum is simply the product of mass times what? Product of mass and velocity. So you see that none of these three is the this, but inertia is this the actually the definition of inertia. And that's why inertia is the right option for this problem. Now let's look at question number five for Wyeck Physics 2018. During a training session, two footballers pass a ball repeatedly between each other. The to and fro motion of the ball is not simple harmonic because the I acceleration of the ball is not directed towards a fixed point 
II restoring force is not directed towards the center. III acceleration of the ball is not directly proportional to the displacement from a fixed point. Which of the statements above are col correct? A. One and I and I I I only. B. I and I I only. C. I I and I I I only. D. I. I I and I I I. So what could be the answer to this? Now, for us to understand it, we need to understand what a simple harmonic motion is. What are the examples of simple harmonic motion? From what we learned, we know that a simple pendulum is an example of simple harmonic motion. And we all know what a simple pendulum is. When you have a rope and you tie a load to it, this is the load. So when you plug this load, load, load like this, it's going to make this motion. So it will continue to move like this. Continue to move. And the acceleration of this ball is directed towards the middle. It's making this motion over a fixed point. Then another form of simple harmonic motion is when you have a helical spring and you attach a load to this helical spring. When you tap this load small pump, you see this thing will start vibrating. It will start moving from one point to the other. It will start moving like this. And as it's making this motion, the acceleration is also directed towards a fixed point. Just like this one is directed towards this fixed point at the middle. Now, when you have your guitar, when you have your guitar, you have the guitar strings that move and are attached to this point. Now, when you pluck your guitar palm, it will start vibrating over a fixed point. So, all these motions, both that of a simple pendulum, the helical spring, and a plucked guitar string plucked guitar string all of them make what we call a simple harmonic motion now one very important uh, attribute of a simple harmonic motion is that the acceleration of the load or the string in this time is directed towards a fixed point very very important and another aspect of simple harmonic motion is that the acceleration of the string or the road load in this in our case is not is actually proportional to the displacement from the fixed point so these are the two things that can make something a, a, a simple harmonic motion whether it's uh, proportional or whether here it is proportional to the uh, displacement or when the acceleration of the ball is not directed towards the center. So for the simple harmonic motion, the acceleration has to be directed. So if you are talking about simple harmonic motion, this knot and this knot here should not be there. But actually, these are the things considered. So for us to now see that this very ball that who two people are passing, these two footballers, they pass this ball to themselves. You can see it's making a to and fro motion because it will go here and go here. But now it is not directed towards the center because this person can apply some force that is even bigger than this person. So the rate at which this one is going is not necessarily the rate at which the ball is getting to this other person. 
So you cannot say that the acceleration of the ball is directed towards a, a fixed point. It's not. Because it's not even a confirmed straight line movement. And you cannot say that the acceleration of the ball is directly proportional to the displacement from a fixed point. There is no considerable fixed point where you can say that the, the acceleration is proportional to the displacement. It's not possible because this person can apply a different force when he's kicking the ball and this person apply a different force. So there is no surety that they, 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 they apply the same force. So in that case, you cannot have the acceleration to be proportional. Neither can you have this. So these two things that makes something a simple harmonic motion, that makes a simple pendulum, a helical spring and a plug guitar, a simple harmonic motion. Here they are put not, not. So in that case, I and I, I, I is the correct answer to this problem. So A is the right option. So A is the right option to this. Thank you. Hello, let's look at this question number 11 for Wyeck Physics 2018. Now we have the question, an object at rest is said to possess A, potential energy, B, kinetic energy, C, chemical energy, D, electrical energy. We all know that whenever a body is at rest, that the type of energy possess is potential energy that is body at rest we all know that and this is energy due to your position at rest in a particular place then we also know about kinetic energy which is energy due to motion energy of a moving body then we know about chemical energy, which is energy in chemical substances. The energy you have in cassava, the energy you have in your food, matter, in the form of food or any other thing, that's chemical energy. Then we know about electrical energy, the very refined energy that you can use in your house and everywhere. It's very very refined it can easily be transported this is energy due to electricity and flow of electrons so those are the forms various forms of energy so the one that is for body at rest or due to height displacement from a particular point is what we call potential energy and that is the answer to this problem. An ob object at rest is said to possess potential energy. If they say object in motion, or object with a moving path traveling from place to place with a speed of, whenever you hear the word speed, moving with a speed, you no, know, it's kinetic energy. Potential energy is energy, is, uh, chemical energy, energy you see in food, or the basic energy that is in matter due to the bond. So the bonds in the matter we'll call it chemical energy electrical energy is energy due to the what flow of electrons or the energy caused by electricity this electrical energy is highly applicable in so many things so i'm talking to you now i'm using electrical energy to power my system and other things so that is the that for this thank you Yes, let's look at this question number uh, 15 for wire chemistry, wire physics, sorry, 2018. The ice point on the absolute scale of temperature is A, 0 Kelvin, B, 32 Kelvin, C, 100 Kelvin, D, 273, 273 Kelvin. So what is the ice point? For us to understand this, we need to 
know about the uh, Kelvin and the Celsius temperature scales. Now, in the Celsius, we know that the we have the let's say for water have the 100 degrees Celsius for boiling they will have the ice point 0 degrees they will also have the absolute 0 which is uh, minus 273 this is for Celsius so we have the equivalent of all these for Kelvin absolute 0 here is 0 then here is 0 anything you have here is anything here plus 273 so if you say minus 273 plus 273 you have 0 if you say 0 plus 273 you have 273 if you say 100 plus 273 you have 373 so that's the difference between a Kelvin scale and a Celsius scale every Kelvin is equal to 273 plus the Celsius so that's how we got about this because we added 273 to everything here to get this scale now this is the ice point we know so the ice point is actually on the Kelvin scale which is the uh, absolute scale temperature scale always know that whenever you say absolute temperature or absolute temperature scale we are talking about the Kelvin scale so what's the equivalent of this ice point in the Kelvin scale is going to be 273 Kelvin so this is in Kelvin and this is in Celsius so the right answer here is D which is 273 the ice point ice point is 273 so very, be very very careful you might be tempted to pick zero kelvin as the ice, ice point zero kelvin is the absolute zero that's the absolute zero and not the ice point ice point is the point the ice uh, temperature of ice which is uh, solid water and that is in kelvin it is 273 so take note and kelvin is also the what absolute scale of temperature so vapor point or, or, or melt uh, boiling point is this point so take note of all these so the right answer is 273 when you are taking it in the absolute scale of temperature which is the Kelvin scale you understand but if you are taking it in the Celsius scale it will be 0 degrees Celsius but you can see that everything here is in Kelvin so that makes the the answer to this problem. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Let's look at this question number 16 for OIEC Physics 2018. Which of the following factors does not increase the rate of evaporation of water in a lake a increase in the pressure of the atmosphere b rise in temperature c increase in the surface area of the lake d increase in the speed of the wind now for us to have a very good understanding of these we have a lake And this lake has water as we all know there's water inside now there is evaporation from this lake now what are the things that will make there to be more water moving from the surface of this lake into the atmosphere Number one, you will know that temperature does that. Temperature. 
if you increase the temperature of the water here they are going to turn into vapor and they will start moving up so temperature is very very important that's number one number two is uh, surface area surface area of this lake if this lake had more surface you understand there will be more water going up so this will also increase the amount of water going up now number three thing that will make there to be more water going up is the speed of the wind speed of the wind if we have breeze flowing heavy breeze flowing what's gonna happen they're gonna push some of this water out of the lake surface and into the atmosphere so breeze will help move as this, as this breeze is flowing in this direction or any other direction it will picking out the uh, water from the top of the lake and be going up so all these three factors will increase the rate of evaporation so what will not increase the rate of evaporation is this option a which is increasing pressure of the atmosphere if there is more pressure if there is more pressure in the atmosphere it will even force water to get back into the stream so atmospheric pressure forces of the atmosphere will only make there to be lesser evaporation so that is why the right option is a that the only factor that will not take note of what is asked here not increase the only factor that will not increase the rate of evaporation is increasing the pressure of the atmosphere every other thing here will increase the rate of evaporation which is as i've already stated these three points will increase the rate so the only one that will not is increase in pressure of the atmosphere thank you Yes, let's look at this question number 17 for WIAC Physics 2018. The bulb of a simple pendulum takes 8.0 seconds to complete 10 oscillations. Determine the frequency of the oscillation of the bulb. A. 0 0.80 Hz B. 1.25 Hz C 7.50 Hz D 8.00 Hz so what is the frequency now for us to understand this very well we know that frequency by definition is simply the number of oscillations number of oscillations per second So number of oscillations over time is frequency. So the number of oscillations that is completed in a second, that's what frequency is. Frequency is the number of oscillations per second. So how many oscillations is able to be completed in one second? Now, if you take this number of oscillation from this is 10 all over time, 8. So, if you do this, you're going to get 1.25 as the number of oscillation all over 1 second. So, if you divide through by 8, 8 here will give you 1 so that you can get per second because it's 1 second. Divide this one by 8, you get 1.25. So, you can say that 1. 0.25 oscillations was done in what one second one second you understand 
whereas you had 10 oscillations done in how many 8 seconds so if you can do 10 oscillations in 8 seconds that means you can do 1.25 in 1 second and the amount of oscillation that you can do in 1 second is the frequency so the frequency is 1.25 hertz that is why B is the correct answer because frequency is simply number of oscillations all over time in seconds so the number of oscillation here is 10 and time is 8 to give us 1.25 hertz that is the answer to the problem thank you hello welcome let's look at this uh, question number 18 for YEC physics 2018 the diagram above illustrates the mercury in glass thermometer used for determining the temperature of a room use the data on it to determine the room temperature a 3.3 Celsius degrees Celsius B 7.0 degrees Celsius C 13.0 degrees Celsius D 30.0 degrees Celsius now this is the diagram we are considering so considering this very diagram we can see that what we actually have is this very uh, thermometer I have this very the mercury that is covered in black now we have the tube now from the indications we can see that here we have zero degrees Celsius and here we have hundred degrees Celsius now from this zero degrees to the point where you have the mercury level we have 3 cm very very important 3 cm whereas from this point of zero to the 100 degrees celsius side we have 10 cm so it's telling us that the total length of this mercury uh, tube inside is actually 10 cm but the level of the mercury here is 3 so what is the room temperature and we all uh, uh, we know that the room temperature is around uh, 25 degrees Celsius that's the standard room temperature But if we are taking the measurement here, we have 3 cm. But the room temperature is supposed to be 25. So if you take half of here, um, if you take half of here, then you're going to have 5 here and 5 here. That's half then if you take half of half so that you can have 25 25 here this is where you can have 25 degrees which is uh, 
the room temperature so you can then read this to correlate so what temperature can it give given that here this is the reading so you can see that the very reading here is somewhere above 25 which we should be assuming to be 30 degrees So from this sketch, we can say that the root temperature here is 30 degrees from the reading here. So if you divide this, because this is 100 and this is 0, divide it into 2, you have 50 here. So half of 50 is 25 and the reading here is just above uh, this 25, so it should be around 30 because it cannot be this, this too small, this too small, this too small. And we all know that room temperature generally is around 25 degrees. So it's very, very okay to assume 30 than the other ones. So, like I said, here is zero from the diagram. Here is 100. Divide it into two, you're having 50. And you have something that is lesser than 50, which we assume to be 30. So 30 degrees is the most likely uh, close uh, uh, temperature and that is the room temperature. Thank you. Yes, let's look at this question number 19 for Wyeck Physics 2018. Frequency is measured in A. Meter per second B. Second D. Hertz I mean C. Hertz D. Farad So what is the unit for measurement of frequency? We know that number 1 meter per second is for velocity as the unit for velocity seconds is the unit for time hertz is the unit for frequency and farad is the unit for capacitance so these are the various units for these various quantities in physics so whenever you hear meter per second is simply the unit for velocity or speed whenever you have times in seconds is units for time and period as well whenever you have frequency it is the unit for or the unit is hertz that is what you use uh, as the unit for frequency. Farad is for capacitance of a capacitor. So the right answer is C, Hertz. Hertz is the is what frequency is measured in. Hertz is what that is the unit of frequency. Thank you. Yes, let's look at this question number 20 for Wyeck Physics 2018. Which of the following electromagnetic waves is most energetic? A. Radio waves B. X-ray C. Gamma rays D. Ultraviolet rays Now, if you look at the scale for frequency or any other thing, you're going to find out that on one side you have the radio waves and on the other extreme you have the gamma rays so in terms of wavelength this one has the highest wavelength but in terms of frequency 
this one has the highest frequency gamma ray has and the one with the highest frequency also has the highest energy so you can check uh, the properties of the electromagnetic waves in terms of their wavelength energy and frequency so these are the two in the two extremes so it can either be gamma rays or radio waves well from what i just showed now the one with the highest frequency which is gamma ray is very very uh, energetic it can move so the answer to this is gamma rays so you have radio waves after radio have you have what to call microwave after microwave then you have other forms of waves like the uh, the infrared the visible light the ultraviolet the the x-ray and other ones so the answer is gamma rays Yes, let's look at this uh, question number 46 for Wyeck Physics 2018. Which of the following particles may be emitted in a process of natural radioactivity? A. Alpha particles and beta particles. B. Alpha particles and X rays. C. Beta particles and S rays. D x-rays and uh, gamma rays actually and x-rays so now whenever there is natural radioactivity the particles that are emitted are alpha particles beta particles and gamma rays now natural radioactivity is what happens in our daily life like when you have mostly it happens in rocks and this actually causes uranium to be disintegrated into radon emitting things like the alpha particle beta particle and the gamma rays now the alpha particle and the beta particles are trapped inside the rock whereas the gamma ray escapes you know it's very light so that's what actually happened so from this option you can see that the option that has the alpha and beta particle is the a option alpha particles and beta particles so there's nothing like x-ray here so this makes this invalid actually makes this one invalid and as well here so this is gamma rays gamma rays is also emitted in the natural radiation but it escapes but the alpha and beta particles are retained or are trapped in the rocks so natural radiation happens in our you, you see the, the, the there is always radiation bombarding from the cosmic space bombarding us here on earth but we witness it mostly in rocks and it actually involved the uh, radioactive decay of this radioactive element of uranium to get radon thereby emitting particles like alpha particle beta particles which are trapped in the rocks and gamma rays which escape so the answer is a alpha particles and beta particles so take note this specific concentration on natural radioactivity Look at question number 48 for Wyeck Physics 2018. Which of the following radiations has the longest wavelength? A. Gamma ray, 
B radio wave C infrared ray D x-ray so how do we go about solving this very problem now when you check out the electro magnetic spectrum you're going to find out that the if you check according to wavelengths if you check according to wavelengths you're going to find out that the one with the long uh, longest wavelength is radio waves followed by microwaves followed by infrared followed by the visible light followed by ultraviolet followed by x-ray then finally gamma ray so that's how it is so we have wavelengths of up to 10 to power 4 here 10 to power 4 to 10 to power 2 whereas in gamma ray we have wavelengths of up to 10 to power 12 actually between 10 to power minus 11 to 10 to power minus 12 so we have the highest or longest wavelength here radio waves so radio waves is the one with the longest wavelength and the one with the shortest wavelength is gamma rays so from that you can easily say that the answer here is b radio waves so radio wave has the longest wavelength if you check according to wavelength wavelength is not the only parameter that you use in checking the quality of the uh, radiation so we have wavelength we have frequency and we have the wave energy the energy of the wave so you can use any of these but considering wavelength this is how they are arranged after radio waves you have microwaves you have infrared you have visible light you have ultraviolet you have x-rays then you have the gamma ray so radio wave is the wave is the radiation with the longest wavelength thank you yes let's look at this uh problem uh question 49 for yx 2018 physics which of the following fields are radioisotopes not used? In which of the following fields is uh, radioisotopes not used? Now, if you check out the uses of radioisotopes or radioisotopy, you find out that they can be used in medicine very very important they can be used in oil industry for oil exploration they can also be used in agriculture very very important so you can use the isotopes in studies in all these fields but the last option weather forecast uh, there is no such in our books from what we've read so far under radioisotopy and its application so it's not actually using weather forecast it can be used in medicine can be used in oil industry can be used in the agriculture but not this so uh, weather forecast is actually the field where you you don't use uh, radioisotopes Hello, welcome. Let's look at this uh, YEC physics for 2018, question 50. A nuclei is represented by B7032. 
determine is neutron proton ratio this this is ratio neutron proton ratio now given that we have 70 b 32 it means that this is the atomic number whereas this 70 is the mass number so 32 is the atomic number and 70 is the mass number but we know that the number of proton plus the number of neutron is equal to the mass number whereas the number of proton alone is the what atomic number so now what is the mass of proton alone is 32 32 is the atomic number now whereas the mass number which is proton and neutron is what 70 so to get the number of neutron we have to do 32 minus 70 so what would that give us we have 0 here and we have 6 minus 3 uh, we have uh, 6 minus uh, we have 8 here that is 10 minus 2 8 then we have 3 here 38 so number of neutron is 38 so we now have and we are asked to find the neutron proton ratio so if neutron is 38 and proton which is atomic number we already know is 32 is 32 so neutron is 38 proton is 32 so what is the ratio so to get the ratio we we'll divide through by the smallest number so if you divide this by 32 and divide this by 32 so when you divide this one you're going to get one so what will you get when you divide 38 by 32 38 divided by 32 will give us 1.187 to your 1.1875 so approximately 1.2 is to 1 so what we get is what 1.2 is to one so 1 1.2 is the ratio and that makes c the answer to this problem so c is the answer because it's 1.2 is to 1 and that is the answer